Good morning, and welcome to the Episcopalians Together in Oxford online service for Sunday, September 27th. If you need a copy of our bulletin, it's available at www.ccqf.org. We hope you enjoy the service. Good morning, and welcome to Christ Church Quaker Farms for Sunday joyful video worship. We're glad that you could join us today. Today, we are privileged to greet our bishop, Bishop Ian Douglas, Bishop Diocesan. He is going to share his word with us through the sermon and his other gifts in leading worship. We are glad to have him here. But before we begin, we have our kid story. In our kid story, our bishop is going to explain to us what a bishop is. And that may be news for some of us, and certainly for our children. And then he will greet us and begin the service. Hello, children and young people at Christ Church in Quaker Farms. I am really pleased to be able to take a few minutes and talk with you about what is the, the life and ministry of a bishop. Because I am your bishop, Bishop Diocesan here in the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. Father John has asked me just to say a little bit about what does it mean to be a bishop and what is a bishop for the church. First thing I want to say is that the bishop is someone who serves all of the faithful, particularly in the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. We are made up of close to 160 churches, kind of like though here at Christ Church in Quaker Farms, but we're spread directly across the whole state of Connecticut, which is known as the diocese, the body of the 160 parishes that make up the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. And as the bishop, as your bishop, my job is to help all those 160 parishes to connect and be together so that as the body of Christ united, we can more faithfully serve what God wants us to be about in the world. We can more faithfully participate in the mission of God. Now, I do have some interesting kit with me that kind of helps to um, inform us about the life and ministry of a, of a bishop. This is kit that comes with being a bishop, and so I want to say just a little bit about it, and maybe that will help you to understand what a bishop is and what a bishop does. First is this stick. You can see this stick. This stick is called a staff or a pastoral staff. It's also called a crozier. And really what it is, is it's a shepherd's crook. You can see it's a shepherd's crook. See how it, it's a shepherd's crook. And, and actually, in all honesty, this is a real shepherd's crook. I bought it online from a sheep supply store in central Ohio for $15. But also later, because this has trouble fitting in my car, um, we had my other bishop from where I came in Massachusetts, Bishop Tom Shaw, had these nice sterling silver joints put into it so I can take it apart and put it in my car. Now, why would a bishop have a shepherd's crook? Well, what does a shepherd do with a crook? It is used as a tool to help protect the sheep. It's used to keep away any other animals that might be dangerous to the sheep, like foxes or wolves. They can use the end of the, end of the crozier to, to poke them away. It's got a crook, a hook, and that's used, and actually this said when I, I bought it from the sheep supply store, it said extra wide hook, good for both necks and legs. What do you mean by that? The shepherd would use this crook to help pull, pull the sheep, either by the neck or by their legs, out of stuck places or dangerous places. So the image of a shepherd's crook and why a bishop has a shepherd's crook is because the bishop and the bishop's job is kind of like a shepherd. I use this crook or I use the, the, off, the, the office and the authority given to me as a bishop to help protect the people when they are in danger, protect them from wrong belief or by any kind of, of threat of, of abuse or difficulty. 
Similarly, a bishop's job is to help lead the people into greener pastures, into places that God wants us to go. So like a shepherd, the bishop's role is to protect and to lead and help the sheep, the people of God, to live full lives, full and abundant lives, as God would want us to have. In addition to the shepherd's crook, I also have the hat. The hat. What's up with the hat? What is the hat? The hat is called a mitre. Mitre is a fancy word for corner. That's what this is, this corner. And what does this mitre stand for? Well, if you recall, in the time of Pentecost, that tongues of fire came down onto the apostles so they could preach the good news of God and Jesus Christ in the many languages of the world. So this pointiness of the hat, the, the corner, the mitre, is to make it look like there are tongues of flame. This is like, like white, hot, white hot flames coming down from God, landing on me, and it shows it's the power of the Holy Spirit to preach the good news of God in Jesus Christ, like the apostles at Pentecost. Now, it also has these two tails, right? These two tails. What's up with the two tails? You can see the tails on the back. What's up with the two tails? Well, in olden days, when bishops were ordained, when bishops were made, they would take the books of the New Testament and of the Old Testament and lay them on the shoulders of the bishop. Lay them on the shoulders of the bishop so that the bishop knew that the bishop's authority was under the authority of God's holy word in scripture. The work of the bishop could only be aligned with holy scripture. So these two tales are to remind me that the Holy Scripture of the New and the Old Testament that contain all things necessary for salvation actually weigh on me, and it's under the authority of the Holy Scripture that I do your work as a bishop. In addition to that, you might have seen I have this kind of big honking ring. You can see this ring. See how big it is? And if you look at it, that ring, that symbol, is the symbol of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. I use this ring as a, an official stamp. In olden days, before there were email and internets, we used to send letters. And before um, there was envelopes with pre-sealed or, or glue on it, letters would be sealed with wax, and then they would take a seal and press into it, and it would make the, the symbol of the seal, of the, of the seal. And what that would represent is kind of like the, the return address from whoever sent the mail. So this, this seal that you can see here of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, I actually used to seal official documents of the diocese. So this is called the Episcopal Ring. And finally, probably, and most importantly, is this cross. This cross is known as a pectoral cross. This area of one's body is known as your pectoral areas. So this is a cross that I keep and I wear all the time, either this cross or some other cross. Whenever I'm functioning as a bishop, I wear a cross, a pectoral cross. And why I wear that cross is to remind me of the love of God in Jesus who died on the cross so that we all in the resurrection might be joined to God and one another in Jesus Christ. I keep the cross of Jesus close to my heart so that all I do as your bishop is filled with the love of God in Jesus. So as your bishop, I function as a sh shepherd would, helping everyone to find abundant pastures and protecting uh, the faithful from any evil or danger. I work under the authority of Holy Scripture, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim God's word, like at Pentecost along the apostles. I take care of the business of the diocese and seal the official documents, but most importantly, all 
with the love of Jesus kept close to my heart. Thank you for being such wonderful young people listening to the stories about what a bishop is and the bishop's kit. Good morning, saints at Christ Church at Quaker Farms. It's a joy to be with you this morning, worshiping together. I'm saddened that I can't be with you and we can't be worshiping together in person as we continue to live with the realities of COVID-19. And at the same time, I thank God that we are able to use technology and the gift of virtual platforms to pray together, to hear God's word, and also to share in worship and the love of God in Jesus Christ. I'm delighted, I'm really delighted to be with all of you. I thank God for your faithfulness and witness in Quaker Farms and beyond. I'm thankful for the, the ministry and work of the Episcopal Church women that is so strong and, and vibrant at Quaker Farms. And I pray, and I pray that all of our life and witness to the living God in Jesus in this very difficult time of the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and the ongoing manifestations of racism in our nation, I pray that the love and mercy of God that we know as the body of Christ can motivate us and help us to be healing agents in the world. Thank you for being here this morning. It is a joy to be worshiping with you. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us pray, saying together, O God, you declare your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may be partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
first reading is from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. For if we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one, holy, and triune God, amen. In our lessons for this Sunday, in addition to the readings from Exodus and the Gospel of Matthew that we have just heard, are verses appointed from the Apostle Paul's letter to the followers of Jesus in Philippi, a city in Macedonia just north of Greece. From his prison cell in Rome, Paul writes to the Philippians, Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being formed in human likeness. 
and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Paul said, let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. These words from Philippians, along with our lessons from Exodus and the Gospel of Matthew, invite us to ponder the urgent question. How often do we make it about ourselves, our own wants and our own desires, instead of about God's love and mercy for all? How often do we make it about ourselves and not about God's love and mercy for all? Take the people of Israel and their sojourn in the wilderness towards the promised land that we hear in our first lesson this morning. They thought it was about them, that the whole Exodus thing was about their being free. They could not see that God was bringing them out of slavery to a promised land as a witness to God's love and mercy for all people. Too often the people of Israel were quick to put their own needs first, neglecting to trust in God. It was all about them as they sojourned to the promised land, their weariness, their hunger, their thirst. Recall how in last week's lesson from Exodus, we heard about how the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron because they were hungry. And yet, God provided for them. God gave them meat when quails descended on their camp at night. And then in the next morning, God prevent, provided bread in the form of manna. And now this week, we hear about how the people of Israel, being without water, quarrel with Moses about their plight in the wilderness. They complain to Moses, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Once again, it was all about them, their wants, their needs. The Israelites had completely forgotten their larger vocation in God's mission. As God's treasured people, they were to be a light to the nations so that all people could come to know the living God. They only sought their own will instead of the will of God thus distorting their relationship with God, with Moses, and with each other. But God did not forsake them in their self-centeredness. God tells Moses to take his staff and go to the rock of Horeb. There God will await Moses. And when Moses strikes the rock with his staff, water will flow and the people will drink. Even though the Israelites quarreled and tested their God, God still provided. Now, the chief priests and the elders in our gospel reading from Matthew, Matthew this morning are not too dissimilar from the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. They too grumbled that things were not going their way, and they were angry that Jesus was upsetting their temple apple cart. Recall the context. Jesus had entered Jerusalem triumphantly and was heralded as a king, thus posing a direct threat to the Roman occupiers and their temple sympathizers. And then to make matters worse, Jesus enters the temple and clears it of the money changers, just thus curbing the income flow for the chief priests and elders. And then seeing such a miraculous display of godly power by Jesus, the blind and the lame come to him. And Jesus heals them and, make them whole, and makes them whole. Witnessing these mighty works of Jesus and feeling the threat to their power and place, 
The temple priests and officials approach Jesus and ask, by what authority are you doing thing, these things? And who gave you that authority? You see, it was all about themselves and the threat to their power and not about what God was up to in Jesus. And what does Jesus do? How does he respond? He asks them, tell me, by what authority did John go about forgiving sins? Was it from the authority of God or by his own authority? This, of course, is a trick question. For if the priests answer from God, then they will be asked, how come you did not believe him? If they say from human authority, then the followers of John will rise up against the priests and the elders for they regarded John as a prophet. So the priests and the elders refused to say anything, answering, we do not know. Jesus then offers the parable of the two sons. Two sons were asked by their father to go and work in the family vineyard for the day. The first said, I will not, but went anyway. And the second son said, Yes, I will go, but he did not. So Jesus asked, which of the two did the will of the father? And the temple officials answer correctly. It was the former. Now, expounding the point of the parable, Jesus emphasizes that those who society frowns upon, the tax collectors and prostitutes, who humble themselves before God and do God's will and thus follow the righteousness preached by John, they will enter the kingdom of God. Yet those of you who are so consumed with your own power politic, your place in society, the priests and the elders, you will miss the love and mercy of God that's offered in Jesus the love and mercy through which tax collectors and prostitutes enter the kingdom of God, and the blind and the lame are healed. How often, how often are we like the people of Israel, wandering in the wilderness, or like the chief priests and elders of the temple in Jerusalem, caught up with our own sense of security and desire for power? How often are we consumed with our own world view, our own sense of what we think is due to us, so much so that we miss the love and mercy of God present in Jesus? Sadly, if you are at all like me, I too often seek my own will instead of the will of God, thus distorting my relationship with God, with other people, and with all creation. That, sisters and brothers in Christ, is the definition of sin found in the Catechism in the Book of Common Prayer. Sin is the seeking of our own will instead of the will of God, thus distorting our relationships with God, with other people, and with all creation. Sin is a state of alienation caused by our own self-centeredness, our own turning our backs on God's love and mercy. Remember, though, that Paul tells us in his letter to the Philippians that God in Jesus crossed the divide that is created by putting ourselves at the center of the equation, by seeking our own will, instead of the will of God. Paul says that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, though he was God, fully divine, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but rather emptied himself, taking human form, fully human, and humbled himself, even to the point of death on a cross. As followers of Jesus, disciples of the risen Lord who triumphed over death on the cross, 
We are called to be like Jesus, to decenter ourselves so that God working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. We are invited to get out of the way of ourselves so that God and Jesus can indeed restore us to unity with God and each other in Christ. That is the prayer book definition of the mission of the church, or better yet, the mission of God in which the church is privileged to participate. God's mission, our mission as the church given to us in baptism, is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. Restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. This restoring and reconciling mission of God in Jesus Christ, in which we are called to participate by virtue of our baptism, is an urgent mission, an urgent mission, especially for us in our nation right now. Living in the midst of one of the most divisive election cycles we have ever seen, complicated by the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and the ongoing realities of racism and white supremacy in our nation, what would it look like if we, following the example of Jesus, humbled ourselves before God and one another? Can we truly, in the love and mercy of God, put the other first and care for those who are at greater risk from COVID-19 by wearing our masks and practicing social distancing and safe behaviors? Can we, who are white, see and believe that we have benefited from social structures and institutions not of our making that favor us while simultaneously marginalizing people of color? And can we work to change these social structures so that all people created in the image of God can be treated with dignity and justice and equality? And finally, can we get beyond the partisan politics that are tearing us apart by prayerfully putting the other and the good of our nation first? I pray that in the love and mercy of God, we can. For I believe that it is in the love and mercy of God and in the truth of the resurrection that demonstrates that love and mercy, that we all can be restored to unity with God and each other in Christ. I pray that it may be so that it may be so for a world living with COVID-19, for each and every one of us in our work to dismantle racism, and finally, for our nation in this election season. May God's love and mercy be with us, and may we be humbled so that we may all participate in God's mission to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. The prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confesses your name may be united in your truth. Live together in your love and reveal your glory to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and all of the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all reference for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Bishop. We appreciated and enjoyed your sermon. Thank you. And now it's time for the peace. If you all would please stand up. If you are alone, we will share the peace with you, and Jesus shares the peace with you. And if you are with others, you can share the peace with one another. But peace is offered to us at this time, wherever our circumstances, whoever we may or may not be with. So, may the peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. God's peace. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. Your offerings to God not only delight his heart, but they delight the heart of all of Christ's church because you keep us going during this difficult time. We thank you and Jesus thanks you. All good things come from you, O Lord, and from what you've given, we give back to you. Amen. And now we invite you to join us in praying as our Savior Christ has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Announcements of upcoming ministries at Christ Church Quaker Farms. First of all, next Sunday, October 4th, we will have Sunday video joyful worship here, and we also will have an outside service of morning prayer, weather permitted, and our guest preacher is Missionary Lynn. Missionary Lynn has been to preach with us many times, and we are thrilled that she's back again from her missions so that she can share the good news with us. So that will be outside Sunday, October 4th um, at 10 o'clock. The following Sunday, October 11th, we will have our Sunday video worship at uh, ccqf.org. And we will also have an outside mass on the grass. Uh, so weather permitting again, we hope that you'll come and join us at either one of those occasions. Now let us stand and sing together. He is exalted. The King is exalted on high.
holy name is exalted, the King is exalted and high. He is exalted, the King is exalted and The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day, this week, and forevermore. Amen. And now for the dismissal, which you'll find on page four of your bulletin. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Have a good week. Y'all come back. <laughs>